Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to our session on the practitioner's views on innovative mechanism for forest ecosystem services, part of the sincere final conference organized together with the Nobel Projects to Projects you either already have heard a lot about yesterday because you've been participating already in the science session yesterday with lots of in-depth discussion on the science findings and the science background of these two projects or because you're new right now you didn't hear too much about them but you know why you're here because we're talking about the practitioner's view now on the results and the, uh, of sincere and Nobel practitioners you in the broader sense we obviously look forward to an exchange with all participants here in in this virtual setting it is virtual because we're still um, uh, enjoying COVID-19 in one way or the other uh, not really I know um, but uh, that's why we're virtual here uh, completely virtual completely online and not in a hybrid or in another in-person setting now, so today we're looking forward to this discussion. You know that the Sincere and the Nobel projects are funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 um, program. You see the reference on the slide, so you even see the number at least of the, of the Sincere project, so you can know where the money comes from that went into all this good work, we hope. My name is Mark Lamberger. I'm with Prospects Institute. We are one of the proud partners of the Sincere Project. And uh, I'll guide you through our session here this morning on the practitioner's view on what we're, what we're doing and what actually are the outcomes and relevance of these outcomes for practice. Now, what are our objectives for this morning's session? We'd like to bring together science and practice stakeholders at European level. I think we're doing this. We have a nice group of participants here together this morning. Uh, it includes people from the two projects, obviously, from Nobel and from Sincere, and people from uh, many different uh, sites, hopefully a lot of practitioners as well, that were asked to join and I know also registered and are behind the cameras here right now. We'll get you more active during this session. This is not a one-way street. We will gonna have a lot of discussions, we hope, and interesting outcomes. Now, that's also um, our point two on the objectives, provide and discuss lessons learned for forest ecosystem services, FES, the mechanisms specifically from the practice per uh, perspective. And then we'd like to explore the further development and a wider uptake really of those incentive mechanisms. Is it any interesting? If yes, how, how should we do that? Um, so these mechanisms that both projects looked into and what about their practical implementation? So this is what we would like to look at. Now, more practice you than yesterday for those who've been there yesterday where it was, as I said before, more on the science. Now, as some of you have not been there yesterday, perhaps still a good idea to learn just a little bit about those two projects. I know for those who've been there yesterday, you now know it, but maybe you can still find something new here in what our two project coordinators are going to tell you about. We have with us Georg Winkel from the Sincere Project and Harald Batschik from the Nobel Project. Georg, could, would you go first and just say a few words about Sincere? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I have uh, three, four slides. Can I share or would this disturb the system? You can share. Okay, good. So let's see what I can share. And if it works better than yesterday, good morning to all of you. Um, just give me a second. There is a again. Okay, fantastic. I think it works better than yesterday. So um, good morning, all of you. Just a few words on the Sincere project and all of those that have been yesterday there and all Sincere partners, run for a quick coffee, be back when Nobel is presented after me. <laughs> Sincere is a project that brings together um, partners from the practical forestry world, uh, from research, um, from think tanks, and here an overview on the partners. Um, we don't have time to go into detail, but I think I saw many of them are today in our workshop, so it's a good opportunity to connect and get to know them. We basically have um, 
a couple of objectives and, um, and methods that are connected to our work packages. So first of all, in Sincere, what we try to do is we looked into the conditions for innovations relating to forest ecosystem services through refuse, but also large scale surveys with landowners. We have been heavily engaging between um, practical people running in concrete innovation actions on the ground, the research side and the policy side in what we call a learning architecture. We had 11 really exciting innovation action cases that I will present on my last slide after that one. Um, now we are in the stage of synthesizing the knowledge. So what we learned bottom up from our innovation action cases about how to deal with um, forest ecosystem services, how to develop new governance or business innovations. But also we aim to um, impact um, European specifically, but not only EU forest policy, um, where ecosystem services, that's what we learned yesterday, have become a key issue on the policy agenda. And finally, of course, we are very, very active in the project in terms of communication, knowledge dissemination. This last slide uh, for the morning is giving a bit of an overview on our 11, what we call innovation action cases. We don't have time to go into details, but what you will note here is that there are different countries within the EU, but partly also beyond the EU. Um, they look in very different ways how forest ecosystem services, and in all cases, actually ecosystem or in most cases ecosystem services that hasn't been prominent in the past, at least in a classical forest perspective, whatever that, that is, um, are incentivized and given value through, through different mechanisms, ranging from auctions to um, collaborative platforms up to new business models. If you want to learn more, just follow our workshop or look at our web page. Thank you very much and I really look forward to this morning and also the afternoon today. Thank you very much, uh, Georg Kwinkel, uh, and for, for actually a very short overview of what Sincere is. We actually have time to go into some of the details, but not all of, all of the details, obviously, of the project, focusing on, on the practicalities, on the practice viewpoint uh, today. Mm. Now, Harald, uh, would you like to give us a very short introduction to of the Nobel project? Also, three minutes, please. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, we had already a great day yesterday in presenting some insights on both projects. So also from my side, uh, a short overview about the Nobel project uh, and the uh, partners. So the, the Nobel project is funded on the Aeronet co-funding, innovating the forest-based bio bioeconomy. So forest values also receiving money from the European Union. Horizon 2020 program, but is also nationally co-funded from the different partner organizations in the countries in France, Germany, Austria, Sweden, Spain, Norway, and Portugal. Uh, what our objectives and project are is that we design methodologies for assessing the economic and social and environmental values of forest products and services. We do that on a lo local level and on a regional level. We try to uh, find out which mechanisms and which business models, uh, which policies are required in order to make uh, payment fixed services schemes successful. And we are very much interested to implement also these business models in pilot demonstrations. So this is a key issue that we would try to work out with these different models and techniques and methods in our pilot demonstrations all over Europe. And one of these innovative ideas that will also be discussed uh, today during the sessions is that we developed a web-based auctioning platform to facilitate the connection between sellers and buyers uh, in payment for some services schemes. Uh, a short overview what takes place in these pilots. Uh, as you know, there are different mechanisms and we will discuss this today in our sessions very nicely. Uh, whether you have auctions, whether you have voluntary payments, whether you have fees and taxes, uh, direct public payments, so different mechanisms of how uh, money could be transferred from the buyers uh, uh, to the sellers. And on the other hand, we have the providers who provide these forest income services. And the key part within the Nobel project is to identify these business relations between those two parties and then uh, develop business models uh, for, in order to see what kind of innovative forest management plans should be set in place that uh, a better provision of forest income services can be provided. Uh, we are going to predict uh, the effects of the management 
uh, regarding the provision of ECOSM services with ecosystem models. We are also interested in the quantification of the ECOSM services by indicators and assessing uh, the value on the economic side. We are also interested in uh, evaluating the trade-offs between different forest ecosystem services because sometimes there are conflicts, sometimes there are synergies. We use for that purpose optimization tools. And as I said, uh, we also have then mechanisms developed for web-based auctioning in order to implement these business models. And we do this all over Europe in five different pilot demonstrations. And our partners are uh, coming from all over Europe and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussions that we will have now uh, the whole day in session two and in session three. Thanks. Thank you very much, Harald, for this very brief overview also of, uh, of the project, of the Nobel project. So, ladies and gentlemen, we think it's important that when we start our discussion that you know where this information comes from and uh, at least a little bit how it, uh, how it has been developed in the past years. This information, those points that we will be discussing during our session today. And Harald also mentioned already the business perspective. That's actually the focus of another and our final session in this final conference this afternoon. If you're interested in that, don't forget to join again this afternoon. But now it's actually really up for the practitioner's perspective. I hope you can uh, see my slides again, can you? Or can you not? So if not, then I just have to see that I um, will share them again and then hope it'll work out. Are you seeing the slides now? Yes, okay, full screen, excellent. Very good. So here very quickly, the agenda of our session this morning. After this general introduction, we're going into exploring the mechanisms for uh, forest ecosystem services that have already been mentioned by Harald and Georg. We will have presentations and discussions in breakout rooms, which enables us to have a bit more of, an, of a direct discussion and also capture a couple of points that after a break, yes, there is a break, um, in the 11 o'clock part of our uh, program, that we're then going back more in depth into. So you will hear about all three sets of mechanisms that we'll show you in a moment. And then we will discuss more specifically, you can choose at that moment, one of those three to look into more specifically before we then get back into the plenary, hear from all three of them and then go towards conclusions and the wrap up in time for lunch. Not to be forgotten, even online in our online existence right now, still have to eat, don't we? And uh, that's at one o'clock. Now, we're going to be looking at those mechanisms, as I said, in breakout groups. There are going to be three groups, uh, each looking at a different set of these mechanisms. There is presentation, and you will follow actually one group and visit one group after the other. So. Don't worry about how that happens. That's in the safe hands of our colleague, Dimitri. He's behind the screen here right now and making sure that you're going to zoom into one of these topics, one after the other, when it is time. Now, what are we going to look at? It has already been mentioned by Harald. So there's the first group on auctions, so something where also Nobel focused very much on Sincere as well. And so here, we have presentations by Thomas Lundhede, Alexander Terry, and Miguel Sotomayor from Nobel, so Miguel and uh, Thomas and Alexander from Sincere, two of the uh, case studies in the Sincere part. And then in group two, we have fees. So we have Andreas Bernasconi and Enrico Viale who are going to be presenting there. Also, of course, followed by discussion on all three cases. That's the same story. Voluntary payments with presentations by Lisa Devenen, Martina Belovic and uh, Belovic Kileman and Martin Jurevic Varga. So also two case studies here that look at very different sites uh, in these voluntary payments. You're gonna be hearing also there some interesting insights, we hope. For practice. Now, the first group is going to be moderated by myself. Then uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce to you the moderator for the second session on fees. That's Miro Preck, our colleague from Prospects Institute. And our third um, moderator, Katarina Faraj, joining here from Berlin, in this case, um, Miro from Slovenia. Um, and uh, so Katarina is going to moderate the third session, voluntary payments. As I said, you're gonna be now in just a moment, zoomed 
into one of those three. Don't worry if it's not your first choice because you're going to hear all three of them and have your opportunity to ask questions, but also to give input to all three of them before the break. That's going to pretty much happen automatically. So within a few seconds, you're going to be brought to one of these groups and then we move into that discussion. You have been transferred to auctions, right? Maybe you didn't realize that's where you were going now, but that's all about auctions, what we're going to talk in the next couple of minutes about. We're going to hear some interesting presentations, and we'll start actually with Thomas Lundhede and Bo Jelis Mark Thorsen from the University of Copenhagen talking about the Danish um, case study in, um, in Sincere and what has come out in terms of auctions that are some relevant points for practice. Thomas, please. Yeah, I it. hope you can hear yeah. me. I'm now just we can. working on sharing my screen. Um, I think we are on. Please let me yes. know if you... We can see it. Yes, okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Thomas Lohnhilde from the University of Copenhagen. I didn't bring Bo today, he, but he was given a slightly different presentation than this yesterday, but it's still about the reverse auctions we did in, in, uh, in Denmark uh, about biodiversity contracts. Um, so I'm not the, the practice partner, I'm the university partner, but we've been collaborating quite a lot with our practice partner. So that's why I'm giving this uh, presentation today. I will uh, divide it in three uh, small sections. We'll be giving five minutes to talk about our research here. So it's not a lot. Uh, I'll first just briefly say why we've been looking at biodiversity in forests uh, in Denmark, uh, then uh, a bit about the theory, the intuition about using reverse auctions, and then uh, some of our empirical results. Um, so the reason why we have chosen uh, biodiversity protection in forest and using our, our IA on this is that uh, Denmark used to be covered in, in forest uh, 10,000 years ago, which means that a lot of our species are adapted to forests and uh, more and more research has shown that we need a substantial amount of forest uh, set aside for, for biodiversity conversation in order to uh, protect our red list species and, and, and many other species. Um, and then back to the whole uh, intuition about uh, auction and re reverse auction. Uh, you probably, maybe some of you saw that yesterday as well. But if we take as a point of departure, we, we look at a normal uh, auction. This is something you all know, is where we have a, a single seller that will sell uh, an object uh, which a lot of people would be interested in. So we have a lot of buyers who are all making bids uh, in order to buy the object that this single seller will uh, supply and this whole bidding process here will drive up the price uh, of uh, the object that the seller wants to sell um, the reason why we call it a reverse auction is because everything has been reversed which means that now we have a single buyer uh, that means that we have uh, just one uh, that could be us uh, in, in uh, the, the pilot case here it could be the danish state that is in demand of biodiversity con uh, conservation. Um, then we have, instead of a lot of buyers, we have a lot of sellers who would make an offer for selling forest or biodiversity con uh, conservation. And this, again, this bidding process now will drive down the price of biodiversity conservation. Uh, so that's why it is a reversed auction. We are seeing that the mechanism here is, is working reverse to what we see in a normal auction. And if we imagine that the Danish state had to uh, uh, buy up a lot of forest or they, they had to uh, make sure that people would set aside uh, forest for biodiversity con uh, conservation, we would see something like this. We would have a graph here where we have the price on our Y axis and we have hectares of the same quality of forest on our uh, X axis. And the curve here is showing what we could call the true opportunity cost. So that means the cost that uh, the forest owner would have for setting aside forest for biodiversity con uh, conversation conservation sorry uh, the problem is of course we don't know that uh, opportunity cost um, so what we normally would see is that uh, a government would uh, apply some kind of a flat rate subsidy uh, where we have a uniform price so that would be the price 
And we would assume that every forest owner that has an opportunity cost, which is lower than that's the flat rate, they would consider to uh, engage in this uh, grant scheme uh, and, and to apply and maybe set a forest, uh, set aside forest uh, for biodiversity. Um, what we also can see is that we have a substantial we call it an information rent, but you could also call it a kind of overcompensation because we have a lot of forest owners who would actually be willing to do it for much less than the flat rate uh, they, they now get. So if we use the reverse auction, we'll ask these forest owners to make an offer or to bid. Um, and we would assume that we still have, I mean, the forest owner would still have an incentive to make a you know, and a bit that is higher than the true opportunity cost, but the competition would drive this uh, bit down. And if if it, it, if it would be like this, we would have a substantially less information rent. So we would see that we would be potentially much more cost effective if we assume that this competition will lower the information rent. Now to our case, uh, the Danish case here, where we had a pilot auction, uh, we did it in collaboration with the Danish Association of uh, Forest Owners. Um, and the purpose here was to make forest owners suggest some conservation action uh, combined with the price they wanted to uh, have for doing this. Um, we did it through a website. It's not a, a, an instrument that we build up. It's just an, a website where they could submit their bid uh, and submit their, their proposed action. Uh, so it, it's not uh, very technical. It's it's simply just a, a kind of website where they could submit these things. Uh, so there were no competition uh, instrument in, in that in itself. So we had a budget of approximately 60,000 euro. Uh, we received 24 bits. We were only allowing forest owners uh, in, a, in a particular area to, to compete here. So given that we, we got 24 bits at approximately 180, uh, 5,000 euro in, in total. We kind of assume that we have what we call a high competition given these restrictions. We also saw quite a high diversity in the proposed actions. We saw from totally set aside forest to conservation of old trees and many things in between. Now we were uh, screening all these uh, 24 bits uh, and, and suggestions against four criteria. That was the effect on biodiversity, uh, permanence, that is the duration of the effects, synergy effects, uh, which could be closeness to other nature areas that, that were under protection, the scale that well, could be the area size of the number of trees, and then of course the price. Based on that, we shortlisted areas that we visited for field evaluations and made another evaluations on, on, on these four criteria. And we have now offered contracts to eight landowners um, who uh, will be uh, willing to, to uh, conserve, conserve biodiversity through this action uh, portal here. Our conclusion so far is that, that we have uh, created some kind of efficiency uh, and we say that because we can see that we roughly have, if you compare to the current subsidy schemes for setting aside untouched forest or for single trees, we roughly have, have obtained the same, about 50% cheaper than the current subsidy schemes. And we also see that, that we potentially have more landowners who are willing to offer conservation because these differentiated actions are seen as less restrictive compared to set aside forest. Um, yeah. That was uh, our conclusions and thank you for your attention. Perfect, Thomas, thank you very much. Now, we will now hear a very different story, uh, ladies and gentlemen, by Alexander Terry from Nature Invest Belgium, also on those reverse auctions that have been tried out in Sincere, but you, you hear some differences. We'll look forward to that. Alexander, all five minutes, please. Okay, thank you, Mark. I hope you can hear me and see the screen. Um, okay, so um, stick with me. I'm going to rush through a presentation about the, uh, our Belgian case. Um, so as mentioned, uh, in Belgium, we also uh, wanted to test reverse auction to see if it's a suitable mechanism to uh, 
provide an alternative or a complement to existing subsidy schemes. And we ended up um, including two types of ecosystem services in the in the experiment. The first one was the wild boar buffers. Uh, I'll explain very briefly what it is about. The second one is habitat restoration and improvements in forested hunting areas. So both uh, ecosystem services relate to the hunting sector. Uh, for each one of those pilots, uh, we applied a different mechanism uh, of the or a different type of reverse auction. The first is called uh, the first rejected prize mechanism applied for the wild boar buffers. So those buffers are strips of low vegetation between uh, maize fields and forest areas in order to, to uh, enable better control of the wild boar buffer, uh, wild boar population uh, and as such uh, lower damages. Um, we were so looking for a ho very homogeneous service, uh, location and dimensions uh, were included in the call and actually were the main eligibility criteria. Once eligible, uh, we mainly looked at price per square meter uh, for each of those uh, bits. The bits were ranked from cheap, cheap to expensive and we calculated then uh, a first rejected price, which is the when the amount that you need for a cumulative area covered for a certain price that you pick from the list, uh, you exploit, explode the, the available budget. Uh, once that's done, uh, there is a payment for all the bids under the first rejected price, price all receive the same amount um, per square meter. Uh, the second type is the discriminative price auction uh, for habitat restoration and improvement in forested hunting areas. In the call, in the in the procedure, we made a description of possible measures that contribute to the improvement of habitats of game species and by trickle down effect uh, to other more rare and endangered species. Um, we tweaked a little bit the procedure and included three fixed envelopes. Uh, and so actually the bits were a description of what people were willing to do for a one of those fixed amounts. And finally, uh, a jury made a selection looking at or looking for the highest quality for a fixed price. The outcome was double uh, for the wild board buffers. Uh, we did two runs. In the first run, we had two little bits, so we didn't actually uh, exceed the available budget, so we couldn't uh, calculate the first rejected price. So um, we needed to, to adapt the procedure, which we did. In the second run, we had sufficient bits to calculate a first rejected price, but still the, bits, the number of bits was too low uh, to actually weigh on the price. So when we sought the approval for um, signing the contracts, we got negative advice from the, the inspector of finance and we needed to stop the, the pilot. The other one was more successful. We received 25 bits uh, for 225,000 euros. Um, the selection was made by the jury, as I explained before, and that resulted in the assignment of 15 contracts for a total of 150,000 euros. We did the first assessment, but this is still work in progress. So these are top lines. Um, we looked at some of the influencing factors for um, making it work. Uh, and uh, a very obvious one, but important one is the reluctance and mistrust that exists for the unknown. Um, uh, and that, that kind of scepticism was exacerbated by these, the first unsuccessful round of the, of the wild boar buffers. So timely and targeted communication is key. Um, the mechanism of first rejected prize seems to need a lot of bits to actually work. Um, we did this experiment uh, in, with, with public funding, so we needed to follow the rules, which was not uh, always the most um, favorable environment to do an experiment. Um, and when you d design uh, 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 an auction, you really have to take into account the existing subsidy landscape, not to double efforts or, or other um, problems. Alexander, uh, uh, the opportunities. To say it, but we need to come to a close. Can you uh, finish? I know five minutes. Great yeah, challenge. I'll finish this one. Uh, so the opportunities of successful um, is that you definitely have less tape for both bidding and supply uh, and and uh, selecting side. You get a satisfying price for both the supply and amount, um, and uh, one one opportunity is you you. You can apply it, but you really need to adapt it case by case in, in, in light of the 
uh, service that you're looking for. I'll skip the rest and we can talk further afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Alexander. Very challenging in this five minutes. So many things to say. Um, but thank you for this presentation. And we come to our last presentation, ladies and gentlemen, by Miguel uh, Sotomayor from uh, no, the Nobel Project. And you looked at it very differently. Different project, different uh, things you did. So in five minutes, let us know what you did in view of practice relevance. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Uh, Morning. So, uh, first of all, just two major differences be between my presentation and, and, and the many ones. So, we are dealing with uh, forward auctions, uh, not reverse auctions. Uh, this is the, the, the first difference. Uh, and in our auctions, the bidders, are, um, uh, the, 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 the ones that want to buy uh, uh, ecosystem services, not the, the, the other uh, way around. And, and the second difference is uh, I'm going to present a work in progress, not finalized work. Um, so let's go for it. So what are the what is the purpose of uh, um, auctions, the, the auctions we are uh, uh, testing? So to increase um, uh, forest owners provision, uh, provision of forest ecosystem services that currently don't have uh, market prices. And uh, just to give you an example for our forest case study, uh, the, um, the forest ecosystem services that we are dealing with are wildfire resistance, soil erosion protection, biodiversity and carbon stock. And what is the rationale uh, of our auctions, the, the ones that we are testing? Um, we will, the auction will sell um, different uh, ecosystem services, each um, representing different preferences from that forest stakeholders. Um, um, and the forest owners uh, will go, not go for any of these um, ecosystem service bundles naturally just because they would lose income. So. What we want with these auctions is to get financing for them to be able to uh, and to be um, willing to um, uh, produce to, to provide those forest ecosystems bundles. Um, and because of that, each bundle has a reserve price, which is the calculated income loss for forest owners. Um, concerning the ocean, uh, the, the auction. Um, uh, our uh, bundle will manage to be um, um, uh, able to be sold if for that bundle, the sum of bids on the bundle will be at, least at the level of uh, the, the, that bundle reserve price. Of course, we can end up with more than one bundle um, uh, fulfilling this condition. In that case, the one with the highest surplus um, uh, for owners over uh, reserve price Will, uh, will win and will be sold. Um, just two additional notes. Uh, all the bids uh, along the auction on non-winning bundles will be refunded to bidders. And um, finally, um, but if we manage to, to sell a bundle uh, using the auction, this will translate in a contract that will last for, uh, it depends on what we define, uh, 25 to 50 years uh, um, uh, time range. Okay, this is a, a, a very brief example of the sort of information we, we, we give to, to bidders participating in the auction. Um, well, in this case, uh, what are at stake are four alternative uh, ecosystem service bundles. The ones uh, in, the, in the graph on the left, the, the ones, the four on the, on the right. And um, uh, uh, together with uh, what we, we call the default bundle. So, what the first first owners will do without the auction. So um, this is the way to present those ecosystem service bundles, but each bundle as this one, as, uh, as for the default one is shown here, is um, attached and, and give the, uh, uh, to a particular management plan uh, presented as a, a, a special distribution of the for, forest species leading to this provision of that bundle. Okay, so we pre-test, this is done online, 
and uh, we pretest the the the, the, uh, the web um, platform uh, ecosel platform to to perform these auctions uh, in two two pretests in the first pretest we we joined together 10 stakeholders a sample of 10 stakeholders and in a in a pc lab environment we um, um, uh, launch an auction and for this first pretest um, uh, four bundles defined by us each maximizing a particular ecosystem service was presented to the to the bidders um, the relative price reserves were kept but they were rescaled to the the number of participants and the 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 the, the average um, um, uh, willing to to bid we found out before in a previous uh, previous survey the the auction took uh, one hour to finish uh, but the bidders uh, were monitoring all along the auction to 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 understand how to use the, the platform okay we have for this pretest uh, this is in the graph on the left the, the the major outcome we managed to sell one of these four alternative ecosystem service bundles the second one from from the left uh, because uh, despite two of them, the second and the third, the two in the middle, I managed to get the sums of bids higher than the respective um, uh, reserve prices. But the second one, bundle two, has the highest surplus. So we did a second pretest online, but still uh, monitored uh, using a simultaneous Zoom meeting with all the participants. Um, and, and, and this is what the, 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 the participants on the auction see uh, um, um, uh, concerning the, the bundles at stake. So the graph I just showed you before and a table um, uh, with the, the four bundles and they can just click on one of the bundles and be able to bid on that bundle. Uh, this is you have one minute left, uh, one minute left. Just to okay, the outcome in, the, in, in that case, because we, we defined a, a, a risk scale for a, very, a higher um, um, uh, value, so we didn't manage to finish this um, um, this auction with a successful and sold um, bundle. So the major conclusions out of uh, of these two echo cell bridge tests: first, uh, we, we we got uh, comfortable that this web platform was um, a friend, uh, friendly um, uh, for for users. Uh, no problems, major problems were pointed out for, to us. Um, but then we, 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 we identify a few issues. Um, we have to work out better the way we, we deliver the information uh, because we have the, the, the impression that bidders tend to focus attention on, on short descriptions rather on the, the more detail we give about the, the, the bundles. Um, the contract time might be, um, uh, as, as I, I'm, I'm saying here, uh, uh, might cool down willingness to pay from, from bidders when it is a too long time range, well, let's say 50 years, which is normal for first years, but, but not normal for, for the stakeholders. And finally, um, the success of auction, this is obvious, but this is a very important um, aspect of the feasibility of these two. Um, um, Matching the reserve prices with the sum of bids from a particular group of, of auctions is not that easy. This match is not easy to be found, at least for the Portuguese forestry conditions. Uh, and also another problem, realistic calculation of the reverse price, it is a challenge. We, we think we, we are dealing with calculations, laboratory calculations that overestimate those reserve prices. So that's okay. how my major conclusions and thank you very much thank Good you very morning. much miguel and for for sharing that we we know it's quite a challenge because in this group ladies and gentlemen we have um we have uh, three presentations and the others you have two so uh it's a bit bit more challenging what we'd like to focus now in the last minutes really um we can't really discuss deeply but what we'd like to hear from you as participants, and I'm going to write those points down, is if you take now what you heard from these three presentations and reflect on it and say, 
what you know is in there for replication and upscaling is it useful is it interesting according to you and what are the issues you find we need to address when thinking about using this experience of auctions reverse auctions and using it and applying it somewhere else um can i get a show of hands you can go directly into discussing and uh, letting us know please anybody Will be good to also, if you can, uh, yes, uh, show your uh, show your faces so we know uh, you know you're there and we can see who it is. Um, so you heard about three different mechanisms within the package of auctions, reverse auctions, three different experiences from a um, from a plat web based uh, tool applied with with concrete results, and then two cases where. The results were at one time very, very favorable, another time very mixed. You know, some applications favorable, others didn't really work. So lots of learning points there. If you now think if we would apply that somewhere else, what are the points that you think we need to think about? Anybody out there, ladies and gentlemen? This is what we would like to do, give you the floor uh, and not just have you consume, which is good. It's important that you know about, about this, but to, to also give something in. And we have a first statement from Georg. Yeah, hi, just to kick us off. Um, I think it's really fascinating and super interesting um, how this has been working out. Um, two, two comments, first of all, it would be really nice for this upscaling to, to document the perspectives really of the different involved groups. So let's say the forest owners, how they saw this, how um, it was experienced by the administration and also the conservation people and then more on, I'm not sure if it's really your question, Mark, about the upscaling. I would be really interested about the spatial effects. So um, you mentioned that you assess this quite carefully, but also to look in, is there, from a biodiversity perspective, are the owners that have been bidding, are these those that everyone has hoped they would do? Things like that, I would be really interested. And then also um, for future research, it's again not upscaling, I realized, to compare it with other tools uh, more systematically. But I think it's fascinating and it's very important in my view also to make it attractive at other places to really document how the owners see this also a bit on the longer time and to perhaps have also knowledge exchange for other regions and countries that want to use this, that forest owner associations can talk with each other what are the good sides and the bad sides, how did they experience it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georg, for these points. I hope you see it. Otherwise, I mean, I'm noting them down so that I can actually later on in the second round tell your points and put them in. Um, other points, Georg mentioned the different perspectives that we need to see and need to be ideally have documented the spatial effects of the biodiversity and the comparison with other tools. Now, anybody else here who is um, who's gonna show us the two-dimensional self and uh, talk to us about what do you make out of this? Any relevance for practice that you see? And if yes, what should we look out for? You have a minute left, ladies and gentlemen, because now we're going to be transferring you to the next round. So this is your one chance to tell us more about what you think of these things. So I see somebody very quickly now. Um, uh, yes, I was just hands. wondering how could habitat yeah? connectivity be ensured if we have auctions, because then we have less control over the areas which will be like uh, where uh, PS scheme like or yeah management regime change will be implemented. Perfect, thank you very much, Oliver, for your points noted down. Uh, we are gonna be transferred in just a few seconds. So thank you very much. Next round, you're gonna have two presentations only with the other two. So you have more time to give these kinds of inputs that Oliver and Georg gave. We're looking forward for that so we can discuss more focusedly um, after the break later on. So in a few seconds, you'll be in the next group. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, and there we are. <laughs> Coming from a different room, uh, Lisa, Martina and I are appearing on your screens. Um, my name is Katarina Farge. Um, so you're now in the room on voluntary payments. Um, or we've been moved to you anyway, but we're going to, in the next half hour, um, focus on voluntary payments. For that, we have two presentations, uh, one from Finland and one from Croatia. Uh, we'll start uh, with a presentation from Lisa, 
um, on a scheme that was a voluntary payment scheme that was developed in the Finnish case of Sincere and the Finnish Innovation Action. And then we'll follow that with a presentation from Martina um, uh, from Croatia. Uh, and that was uh, an action that was implemented uh, and tested in a Croatian um, uh, recreational area. And they will both share their experiences with these with these actions. After um, those two presentations, there is time for your questions. And of course, also a little bit of a discussion if, if we wish to have that. But um, first, uh, Lisa, the floor is yours again. Thank you very much and a very good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Uh, yes, it's working. Okay. So my name is Lisa Pyrven and I work at the Natural Resources Institute Finland and I'm going to briefly tell you about our experience uh, regarding landscape and recreation value trade in Kuusamo, Finland. Kuusamo is located in northeastern parts of Finland. Uh, area is uh, one of the key tourism, nature-based tourism areas and the, the tourism is growing there and it's relying very much on, on uh, attractive forest landscapes in its business. We also have a very intensive forest uh, industry there and forest cuttings uh, that affect the quality of the landscapes. Uh, we have no incentives uh, for safeguarding the landscape and recreation values to land our owners and most policy measures are targeted for timber production and some, some for biodiversity now in, in, in uh, South Finland. Uh, the idea in this uh, trade is that tourism sector would collect funding and, and compensate for private forest owners for, for enhancing these amenity benefits. We have studied the preconditions earlier uh, interviewed or made a survey among the tourists and also the landowners, forest owners, and have found that there should be enough uh, uh, voluntary uh, willingness to, to, to participate. The leader in this innovation action was Finnish Forestry Center and our role was a, a supportive, we had a supportive role. And uh, the, the pilot we, we did, uh, we executed it together with Rukakus of a tourist association uh, who was uh, governing the funds and, and basically take uh, officially in charge of the, the uh, collection of the funds. So why we went for voluntary payments, I, I mentioned that there is not a really public uh, support uh, available uh, for this type of uh, uh, work and one thing what we found uh, also uh, in this uh, when we're starting this that Finnish legislation regarding who can collect funds uh, and 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 how is very uh, much regulated only uh, non-profit organizations can collect funds uh, for this type of purpose and and we could not find that type of uh, organization to to work with us Fortunately, last year, spring 2020, uh, small scale fund collection became possible. That was for three months and up to 10,000 euros. In our local uh, multi actor group uh, meetings, there were different views who should pay. People were hoping that public uh, ministry, ministry or some other public funder would, would, would help uh, in, in raising the funding. But finally, we, there was, uh, this was the, actually the only uh, choice to, to start collecting voluntary payments from visitors and, and tourism companies to see how they would react in practice. So a few words about how, what kind of areas we were targeting and, and were eligible for, for this, this trade. We are focusing on mature old forests located in key areas, key views along the trails, along roads where many people see them and, and which are usually regenerated often by clear cuttings. Uh, management in these uh, hotspots, uh, we, we could uh, use total protection or make a management solution that maintains key values like continuous, continuous cover forestry and so on. And we targeted for 10 year contracts 
adapted to the site with, with landowners. And here you see the map of the, there are, it's not covering a large part of the forests, but, but we have uh, picked the, the hotspots uh, uh, using uh, forest inventory data and, and um, visual sensitivity analysis in this area. Uh, fun collection, collection uh, it was done a year ago. We had a marketing campaign uh, with videos, media release, and, and then social media was the key uh, channel in uh, locally to, to market this to, to, to people to give donations. Uh, donations were collected by text message, phone calls, mobile pay, and payment, direct payment to the bank account. And actually, the donation was the story that was to, to the donated donors that, that we give the compensation to local forest health in the picture here. Results, we uh, collected a small sum uh, due to several challenges, which we may have time to discuss. Uh, we we uh, have done one fixed contract with local landowners this year. What uh, could we see that uh, say that what, what we have achieved? We have created a cost efficient model to enhance landscape biodiversity values in practice that could be continued. Uh, we have boosted attitudinal change among local uh, stakeholders. There were quite uh, opposing views uh, how forests should be uh, used and, uh, and, and conflicts in the area and, and uh, we feel that we have uh, mediated existing forest, forest related conflicts by introducing this kind of system. And uh, there is one spin of a new research and development project looking at possibilities how to integrate uh, this system to in include carbon compensation also to this system. Some conclusions. Well, this idea seem to be still uh, rather new to tourism sector. And, and it, this type of new system requires a lot of communication. Also, one of the key conclusions is that all, not all the pieces are, are uh, present for creating this kind of uh, pest system based on voluntary payments. It's, it's, it's really difficult. As, as, as discussed yesterday, fundraising legislation is very, very uh, strict. And finding a local trading agent was, was uh, quite difficult also. So the local spokespeople were not, we didn't find really uh, so many who were really, really uh, willing to actively engage. Uh, tourism sector is much less organized than forestry. Uh, so uh, they would need, uh, entrepreneurs would need more institutional support. And uh, looking at forestry sector, uh, there would be more uh, stronger support needed to, 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 to support these kind of activities. May, uh, mainly, uh, we would need broader range, broader range of extension services to cover all forest dependent sectors, including nature based tourism. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, all I have to say about this uh, system now. Thank you so much, Lisa, for uh, this first presentation, uh, which gives uh, quite some food for thought uh, for our discussions. Before we move into those discussions, I would like to give the floor to uh, Martina Jojevic Vaga um, from um, the Nature Park Medvinica uh, and give us the um, maybe a different kind of experience um, uh, that happened in or that was collected in Croatia. Martina, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Martina, and I will present failed implementation of one uh, mechanism. Uh, I just uh, firstly want to say that our public institutions don't manage forests in the park. Uh, we are managing area in matter of nature conversation, monitoring species, and uh, visitors. So, Um, for the introduction, um, just a few words about the uh, nature park. We are protected area connected with the capital and surrounding the 
almost quarter of Croatian population. Uh, we have 1 million visitors per year. 90% of them are domestic. 90% uh, uh, of those domestic visitors are locals. Uh, they use a park as recreation area. There is no entrance fee, everything is free of charge. A uh, public institution is financed from the state budget, that is a, a really small budget. And um, uh, our visitors expect from us to uh, provide facilities and um, uh, other infrastructure for sport and recreation. Uh, we have a lot of those recreation bike trails, uh, ski slopes, hiking trails. Uh, so at the second mug meeting, uh, we decided the stakeholders to go with two mechanisms, one-time concession permits and donation boxes. Donation boxes works fine. So according to law, uh, we can charge everything what is organized in the area, uh, everything what is commercial or profitable to organizer. So for uh, innovation action, we decided uh, uh, with funds raised from sport activities uh, uh, charged for with uh, concession permits to put in uh, recreation infrastructure to maintain uh, old one and for new facilities. And with donation boxes, we tried as a voluntary mechanism for payment that is not innovative mechanism, but is first time implemented in our area. So our starting point was to raise funds for new facilities and uh, provide information to visitors uh, about well-being by walking particular trail. Um, they were asked by our Facebook and website uh, for what they want to raise funds for the first year of implementation. And uh, that was for Nordic Trail Barrier to um, uh, stop uh, parking cars on that part of the park. So what happened in the field? Um, and um, we put uh, in the field uh, two donation boxes on the start of two most um, uh, visited uh, hiking trails. Uh, we have a few burglaries, uh, one destroyed box, uh, visitor putting garbage in boxes, small papers and similar, and uh, very little money raised in six months, only 50 euros. Why is that so? Because our visitors are not aware of a protected area, they don't perceive uh, ecosystem services. Uh, they think they already spend enough for ecosystem services by uh, paying household bills because all of them include taxes for water sheets, renewable energy, and similar. So in our park, donation boxes failed. Uh, we did also through innovation action a small pilot search about uh, energy capacity of hiking trails and collect uh, interesting informations about impact while you are walking that trail. And also we did a visitor survey about well-being, uh, about public awareness of pests, about health recreation and willingness to pay. Uh, so, uh, also in creation, uh, we have a legal obligation for big companies to pay some kind of FES fee. And that is not a big amount, but companies don't want to impose taxes. So, I think Croatia is probably moving in the future to abolish this tax because it has been increasing for years. So our conclusion is that donation boxes as a payment mechanism don't work, uh, but somewhere else we don't see why should not be a good mechanism. Uh, we are very well aware, aware that we have to continue to work intensely on education and raise public awareness about FES. And uh, we want 
uh, set aside donation boxes. They will remain in the field as some kind of indirect education tool. We will change labels with information about forest ecosystem services, about uh, nature conservation, well being, uh, how to leave no trace while you are visiting park and similar. That would be all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martina, uh, also for sharing um, an example where things didn't go all well, um, which is not something that you get to see a lot, but where you can draw a lot of lessons from uh, and, um, of course, uh, see what's possible uh, somewhere else, maybe. So thanks to uh, both ladies for their presentations. Um, we now have some time for questions if you wish um, to the to the presenters. You can do that either by raising your hand uh, and then voice your question orally, which is of course very nice. If you prefer to put it in the chat, that's of course also an option. Um, so um, in case um, you don't know yet where to find that, the chat is of course one of the options at the bottom bar of your Zoom application. And you also find the place for reactions, which is a little smiley. Uh, face and there you can if you click on that smiley face you get the option to raise your hand and then uh, we know that you have a question or a comment towards our two presenters um, so if there's anybody that wants to post a question or comment please do so if nothing is yet on your mind then uh, I have a question towards you um, which is basically now that you've heard those two examples of voluntary payments is there anything you think that's interesting um, because that could be replicated somewhere else or upscaled um, somewhere else? So to all of you in this room, not just the presenters, but everybody in this room, is there anything you heard where you thought, oh, these two examples, this is something interesting that could work maybe there, or there's an element of it that was particularly interesting that um, one should look at because it has quite some replication potential anywhere else in Europe or even the world, if you wish, um, that would be interesting for us to, to get an understanding of. After the break, we will dive deeper or you will dive deeper into replication and upscaling in, your, in the group of your choice. Uh, but for the moment, I think it's nice if we could um, have an idea from you what you, your first reaction is on those two presentations. Um, anybody from the group? comments, questions, or even an answer to my question. Yes, Jeroen, please go ahead. <clears throat> yes, hi. Um, I have a feeling you need state involvement. I think that specific of just uh, voluntary contributions will not, uh, will not, will simply not work unless you have much more awareness in the public and especially in business. So uh, for now, I think uh, without government involvement, you will end up basically with nothing. And, and you link that to the yet still existing low level of awareness in amongst citizens and the public or? Um, that's a very good question. You have to ask a social scientist, I think. You need some research about it, but I think that um, well, if I speak from a Western, West European country, I think uh, we all do pay a lot of taxes. So I don't think people are not are very much, uh, are very quick to 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 pay extra for things which are basically already uh, paid for, in some sense or another. That that matches. Uh, that's just yeah. that's just one of the uh, the issues I think. Yeah, that matches the experience of Martina. Um, of course as well, where uh, the local population thought they're already paying uh, for quite some services. Uh, so why would they need to pay extra? Thank you, Jeroen, for your view. Yes, Lisa, please go ahead. Uh, if I comment uh, quickly, this landscape and uh, recreation value trade has been actually, the idea has been presented uh, some, some years ago and it has been discussed and called for. Uh, between among different stakeholders, but then when the actual situation comes, who, who puts it into practice? So we don't have institutions who take care this kind of, could take on board these kind of tasks. So I also uh, think it was useful to, to show that it's possible if the, the key stakeholders get on board, but also it was the test for them to see how 
how active they actually are. So uh, we haven't uh, yet uh, published the, the results in Finland, and, and I am hoping that we can get a fruitful discussion about, about the next steps. Uh, but there are calls that this kind of system should be taken on board uh, in, in different regions in Finland because it's it's the, one of the only ways to 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 guarantee the landscape uh, values in, in important places. Okay. No, thank you, Lisa, for that for that intervention. Um, there is a question from Georg in the chat to both presenters actually. I think a partnership between forestry and nature-based tourism, or something like that, um, is emphasized in the EU forest strategy. Have you seen this? And per perhaps is it relevant to connect to that? Martina, do you want to maybe start on that one? OK. I know that <laughs> that fact from EU forest strategy, but I think uh, in our uh, park, it's not so that we don't uh, uh, have good uh, relationship with forest in the forestry, but uh, that is a problem of uh, state of mind of our locals and uh, most of our visitors. Uh, they uh, we have conducted a questionnaire visitor uh, survey, so they were asked uh, if they know what are forest ecosystem services can they uh, say or uh, they are aware of some of them for example oxygen production uh, but um, they are also aware of well-being by practicing sport uh, activities outdoor in the park but they still are not willing to pay voluntary for enjoying nature and also they uh, think that public institution is um, uh, someone um, is a subject who have to provide facilities in the park even though park is 50 percent um, private owned and 50 percent state owned so also there is a lot of stakeholders in the park on the local and state level and private. Um, they all have different interests and uh, it's sometimes hard to find uh, some, uh, how do I say, to agree on uh, something and the visitors I think they, because they are 90% locals, they think that using of the nature, even though is if it is private owned, uh, they birthright. I think it's problem in Medvednica is state of mind of locals. Thank you, Lisa. How about you? What's your if there's is there a good, good link to the EU forest strategy? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's there. It's definitely this kind of uh, forums collaboration needs to be strengthened. In our case, it was still uh, this, this uh, debate, uh, who should pay? It's not, not clear because people, some stakeholders in our multi-actor group stressed many times that we, we should look money from ministry or, or, or the, the municipality or EU. EU funds should be available for this. And basically, it's it's true that it's really tough to get the money uh, from from voluntary payments. There are hundreds of thousands overnights in 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 uh, in, Chur in Kusamo, and our our original uh, suggestion would be that everybody pays one euro to 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 this uh, fund. But uh, for some reasons, uh, it wasn't po possible to do. The idea here is that with, with uh, crowdsourcing, everybody gives a little bit, this problem would be solved and we have our system uh, set up. But, but still, uh, I guess the realism could be that, that maybe 50% comes from public funds and 50% would, could come from private funds, entrepreneurs and, and, and visitors. That could be something that uh, then, then you would be these public and private sectors would be supporting each other, but that would need some 
policy incentives or some funding from, from e either national funds or EU funds. So who pays is the and where to get the funding is the is still the key key thing. Very good. Um, Lisa, uh, or actually a question to, um, to both um, from Christian. Have you thought about combining opportunities for donating with other payments? So for example, existing payments for fishing licenses or something like that. So a combination of um, donations and other more fixed uh, payments, Lisa. Yeah, we thought about it. There was one suggestion to combine it with fishing payments and so on, but the number of uh, visitors are limited and also then why they only they should pay. So, yeah, it's uh, it would be quite still quite small, uh, small or only part. Also, there we are a lot of cottage owners there. They, they could be donating, but then it should be a separate system. And that's why we went for this kind of uh, a general system, which, which has a lot of a potential as, as there are many, many tourists and, and visitors and then entrepreneurs could also join in to, to, to that there was be, would be enough mass for, for, for that little donation would make a difference. And may I answer to have I do I have time to answer? This? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, um, Georg is asking about the idea to link it to carbon offsets. Yes, we are. We are have now this spin of uh, project where we are uh, looking at uh, possibilities how we could co uh, co connect to, to carbon offset because that seems to be one of the key targets now for tourism tourism sector, and and that has has come more and more strongly. So we have a funding to continue to develop this model that it would be even more attractive to tourism sector. And there's a uh, question about 10 years. Uh, yes, 10 years is a short time, but uh, our survey with the landowners show that they are not willing to commit themselves for a very long time. 10 year contract was is, is uh, generally accepted because they may change, may change their time and, and 10 years landscape, uh, nice landscape is, is a good time for entrepreneurs and uh, forest growth. So you can you can maybe shift the activities to another area, but but at least for 10 years, the environment where you operate is, is secured. So that's that's a good start. Idea is of course to continue the, the, the contract for another 10 years, but it's also a question of money. If you don't have money to pay, for, for a long period of time, then it's better to pay, start paying for 10 years. And, and uh, yeah, it's, this, this links to the, the funding, funding possibilities also this, this length. It's more cheaper to, to let uh, some sort of management and, and timber, timber uh, values also for landowners and, and, and plus the landscape linked to that rather than the total protection, which is expensive. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm afraid that brings us to the end of um, this first round uh, for this group. So at some uh, moment in the very near future, Lisa, Martina and I will be moved to our third group and you will get your third group of moderator and presenter. So the, the third topic that you have not yet had a chance to listen to and respond to. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we, we were just you were parachuted in that room and we, we were staying here without knowing uh, and we is uh, our uh, alba uh, who is assisting me and who will be inputting uh, the results of the discussion in the powerpoint and of course the, the most important the most important role goes to our presenters andreas uh, and enrico andreas will present the case on which uh, they are working which is the funeral forests and Enrico will talk about the mushroom picking in his region, in his areas. We have roughly half an hour. Uh, after the presentations, we will have a discussion uh, to which you are warmly invited to participate, ask questions, make suggestions, especially to identify potential for replication. Say if there is something that you would like to see in your environments, 
let's go to the first presentation. Andreas, if you please tell us more about uh, your exciting product, your mechanism. Okay, thank you very much, Miro. Uh, do you see the slide? Okay, yes, so I invite you to a short journey into a funeral forest. Here we are standing in front of a funeral tree in Lenzburg in the canton of Argau in Switzerland. It has a number, that's all you see, so it's inventoried and dedicated to a person. This is not a funeral forest, it's a cemetery in a forest, that's not the same. Whereas here, this is a funeral forest. Some of these trees which you see are dedicated to ancestors. So title is exploring forest ecosystems or its mechanisms linked to funeral forests with a special uh, foundation of payment for ecosystem services. And it's one of 11 cases within the Sincere project. So just to be clear, what is a funeral forest? It's a place, a tree in the forest dedicated to an ancestor, the size of Funeral forests are between half a hectare up to 100 hectares. Um, you have single trees or spaces in the forest dedicated to ancestors. And you have contracts with the clients. They go from 20 up to 50 years. The fee depends a lot on the specific services and the duration. So you find offers between 500 up to over 6,000 euros. Often you have no signs, no non-forest material, no special paths. And the silviculture, of course, must be adapted. It's single tree based. Normally the tree is important, so the tree is kept over a long period. And there is just a reduced silvicultural treatment later on. The service providers often are specialized companies and newly forest owners and forest enterprises. In Switzerland, we have around, I estimate, 120 up to almost 200 funeral forests. In Germany, there might be between 200 and 300 funeral forests. This is a map of Lenzburg. The green area is the forest owned by the municipality, and the three spots are areas with funeral forests. It's around the city, and the total area of these spots are around five hectares forest. Another image of such a funeral forest, the blue point of this tree marks that this tree is a funeral tree. Now some examples, you have single trees, then you have specific, specific named trees like forested tree or angel trees. You have family, community trees, partner trees, then specific services like tree planting or scattering ashes in special areas. And of course, there are all kinds of examples, also hill graves, etc. Now, if I take the ecosystem service cascade that we have been shown yesterday, starting with the forest and its services on the left side, the management link to it, and additional services and the values on the right side. I put now the activities going along with the co-production of these funeral forests. I came up to this value chain. So it starts with growing the forest and preparing these specific spaces, the area selection, the finding of the trees and inventorying of them, and then the contracting with clients. Afterwards, there is the funeral arrangements, the cremation and the burial act. And after the burial act, there are after burial ceremonies, visits of families and friends and the maintenance of the place. So we try to put this in a, in a business model. Here you see the funeral forest in the center and the dimensions linked to it. So below, it's a place of identity, of course, for the clients. It's also a place of peace and an old tree habitat. And here now some 
different approaches. I lined out or, or outlined four business models linked to the co-production procedure, the value chain. On the left side, you have the value chain, these um, activities. And now typically is the model one. So the forest owner, he grows the forest, he prepares he, the spaces and he allows third parties to do the services, the co-production of other services. Whereas in model two, three, and four, the forest owners gets more active. In model three, he is also making the contracting with the clients. In model three, he does additional activities linked to after burial uh, ceremonies and visits. And in model four, he's even involved in the act, the burial act. So these are different approaches linked to this specific offer. I come to con conclusions. One is I'm convinced there are important and growing markets for cultural ecosystem-based offers, which are marketable. I mentioned just forest kindergartens, adventure parks, forest therapy offers or funeral forests. But often these markets are taken over by actors and not by other actors and not forest owners. So however, forest owners could co-produce such services. But if they do so, of course, specific skills and services are need needed, procedures must be adap adapted and other instruments are needed. So with business, business as usual, this step cannot be achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas, for your very interesting summary presentation. We will come to that later. Now I would like to invite Enrico to tell us more about your model, your mechanism uh, with regard to mushroom picking. Enrico, if you please. Th thanks, Miro. Thanks. Uh, so here again, uh, the top. sorry. And uh, I will uh, introduce you to the case uh, of a wild mushroom uh, collection fee in Borgotaro. So everything starts from a big problem in the Second World War, where the people from Milan who, uh, used to go uh, in Borgotaro area, <clears throat> in Borgotaro area to collect uh, wild mushroom. So this guy at that time sit down and they decide to introduce a fee in order to commercialize the right to collect awesome. mushroom. And this was an inspiring mechanism that was uh, introduced at the, let's say, national scale in 1993. It's a still ongoing debate because um, uh, you need to set up the price, you need to decide uh, which uh, area of the forest uh, you need to improve uh, and so on. So the mechanism, is uh, quite simple. So um, you apply a civic culture model that is uh, uh, show here. So this represents the wild mushroom production in forest. It means that uh, after 40, 35, 40 years, uh, the wild mushroom productivity collapse in the forest. Here we are talking about uh, copies forest. So you start to cut. After you cut, the production disappears for seven years and then it start again. The customer, instead of purchasing uh, wild mushroom in the uh, green grocer uh, close to their house, they come in the forest and they pay the fee to enter in the forest. And this fee is applied differently in according to this, uh, uh, this function. So it means uh, uh, the fee is calculated by the uh, forest intense, uh, the manage, uh, the incentive intensity of the forest management, the control by local police or uh, forest guard uh, that uh, <coughs> are hired for control and the access to the forest. And the range of the price per day is between uh, six in the white uh, area that you find here to up, up to 22 uh, euros uh, per day, which means uh, uh, that does, it costs quite a lot if you think uh, uh, for um, for a normal person to pay that amount of uh, money. But 
If you consider that there are something like 100,000 people that are in the forest uh, as minimum, uh, that generate, uh, sorry, that generate uh, um, more or less uh, in the lowest, uh, uh, in the season that doesn't uh, grow the mushroom very well, roughly speaking, 0 0.4 million euros of turnover. It means uh, that uh, um, it generated as much as the money that is generated in a normal forest uh, just uh, for uh, wood production. So, among these people, there are several young guys that uh, uh, somehow uh, they didn't want to queue um, to buy the picking permits and they want just to have a click uh, to purchase it. And so we introduced, uh, thanks to the Sincere project, uh, an app that trace, uh, so you, you can purchase the ticket and trace you <coughs> in the forest uh, for two reasons. For, first of all, for rescue system, so you just need to type down the contact of the uh, person that one um, that one that is allowed to to call the rescue team in case uh, you get lost or you don't uh, return home uh, in a certain uh, time. And second, to improve the forest management of the forest. So it means uh, uh, that uh, using the geo tracking uh, information, you, you have the possibility to implement correctly and spread the, the silviculture model in key area where somehow you have uh, um, less amount of people that enter in the forest or you have a high con concentration of people where uh, there is a, a certain specific structure of the forest. So let's say from a forest that uh, was managed uh, like um, in the 60 or 40, so just with papers and calculation for, high uh, for increasing wood production, Right now, we are in the forest 4.0, where the big data are used to improve uh, the quality of the management and, of course, the revenue for the forest owner. The app are available here for Google Drive and for iOS. It's still uh, pending the, um, uh, the authorization by the privacy authority. If you have any question, please let me know. Are there any, uh, is there anybody who would like to contribute to the, this discussion by um, putting forward some ideas, questions? For the moment, um, while you're still preparing your question, maybe a question for uh, Andreas. Uh, Andreas, towards the end of your presentation, you mentioned that um, there are different in different business models there are different uh, possibilities for the owners to acquire the services or develop the services or skills that they don't already um, who provides those services and how can the the, the the owners resort to them how is that system developed in your case okay so normally the there are in, in switzerland there are two big um, firms that provide these services and they uh, look for good spaces all over Switzerland and then they contract the forest owner and normally they just pay a rent to the forest owner. That's how normally it functions. Mm -hmm. But in, in this case, in the innovation action, the forest owner did, after he was contacted by such a firm, he thought about it, he made an analysis of the situation, a feasibility study, and then he decided to, to do it himself. So this was the act of innovation for the forest mm -hmm. owner, that he decided, okay, uh, we can do it ourselves. That was the big step. And then they had to do, to develop all the elements, the contracting, uh, the silviculture, uh, and all the additional services. And they developed it by their own and by um, with interchange with other existing. 
is this something that could be replicated or upscaled in the, in, in the sense that you know there is a model there could be templates and um, could be exported to other environments um, that's one of the key elements of, of our innovation action that we are convinced that this model could be adapted in other cases. It could be with funeral forests or it could be with other services as well. So, but the, the big step is for the forest owner himself. So does he want to, to become a service provider and not a production uh, oriented uh, enterprise? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a kind of shift the mind of the forest owner and the forest enterprise in what direction to go. Thank you very much. We have a question from Christian. Christian, would you like to ask it yourself or you would like me to read it? Okay, just read it then. Um, uh, the Christian is asking, what are the contingency and insurance plans if something happens to the funeral tree? So, um, that they don't have a specific, um, how to say, uh, insurance, but what they do is in the contract, they precise what happens if a tree dies uh, and what has to be done. So in the, then they would replace the tree, they would um, take it away and plant a new tree. So that is precise in the contract. Mm -hmm. I think that Christian has an additional question or uh, am I wrong? Yeah, I just wondered, could you potentially uh, reshape the tree into some furniture or something that the family could enjoy? I don't know, that could could be an add-on eventually. Yeah, that, that's a creative idea, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> as far as I have seen, there's no such uh, element uh, in the contract. What you have to, to see is that there is a really special relationship between the clients and the foresters. The forester, he's, he knows the forest and he tells in, in he's a storyteller for the family. So he, he gets a special relationship to the forest, to the, to the clients. So in case this would happen, then of course he would be in contact with them. So it, it, it's really a personal also interaction between the forester and the clients okay thank you thank you thank you both uh, we have a question from Mireya uh, you can find it Mireya would like to ask it yourself or sure I, I can ask well uh, yeah. my interest is to know what type of clients do you attract in your business because I assume that if you are a really experienced uh, mushroom picker maybe I mean what is the difference what do you get extra that you, you you will pay for these services if I can go to a neighbor area and find uh, mushrooms there for free? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, in the neighbor area, uh, the, the mushroom are not for free at the moment. Uh, so you pay even in the neighbor area. And the, pro uh, the, the reason why they pay so high money is just the probability that they get uh, they have uh, a good uh, peak uh, for one single day. So um, it's just uh, this reason. The professional pickers pay usually annual uh, fee that is quite high. It's around uh, uh, 300 euros per year, up to 500 euros per year. And uh, for instance, for professional, they can purchase... Uh, uh, general uh, picking permits uh, that can they can go all over the area that are <clears throat> under management. Uh, about the the fee that they pay, uh, the fine, sorry, that they pay in case they do not uh, uh, respect the the law. So, for instance, is around uh, sixty euros per kg of mushroom that exceed the quota. Uh, plus the um, uh, so they they they, uh, they take the mushroom and they provide to uh, charity organization 
uh, in case you have no the uh, picking permits, uh, uh, there might be also in certain area a penalty, um, uh, fine, uh, um, a penalty, uh, let's say, uh, process in order. Uh, so you go in front of the judge because uh, it's considered like uh, uh, stealing something uh, from a house. So it's property of the forest owner. It's something like you enter in a apple orchard and you start to collect um, apple without the permission or without paying the apple so it's exactly the same so you go to the penalty court <clears throat> then there are other um other fine for instance if you enter in the car with uh, with your car without authorization you can get uh, even six, uh, 600 euros per um, fee per uh, that violation. And then uh, there is uh, another uh, fee, for instance, if uh, uh, you have more, uh, if you have uh, boxes that are not uh, author authorized, uh, something like plastic bags or something like uh, that does not allow the mushroom to breathe inside the, the basket, uh, well, you get a minor fine that is something like 20 euros. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Enrico, for explaining that. So markets are, 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 are shared or there, there, there is a market uh, also around your market. Are there any other questions that you would like to put forward to our presenters or a comment you would like to make or maybe share your own experience from where you are? Our idea is to really see what in these two models, in these two mechanisms, is could be replicated uh, outside those areas uh, and outside those uh, funeral trees and uh, mushroom picking uh, areas. If there are no questions for the time being, and uh, I, I really encourage you to do it because we don't have uh, much time left. Um, I would have another one which relates to the contracts that Andreas has already mentioned. So the contracts that you do, Andreas, they're mostly with people, let's say, I would do a contract with you as the owner for the moment when I die and I would pay uh, pay for, for when I'm dead. Or is it, uh, uh, with whom do you do, do you do these contracts most of the time? Yes, it's the, exactly like you describe it. So you would do the contract with the forest owner and the, the money you pay is for this place, for this tree and all the conditions that are described in the contract. Mm -hmm. And then there is a duration, at least 30, in some cases, even up to 50 years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there was um, the application that Enrico mentioned, uh, an, a very useful application, I would say, because it uh, helps you trace the person, but also the quantities, and also it also helps you manage the forest. Um, so Enrico, uh, oh, exactly. I, I, I was also surprised, I was also, for instance, I was surprised to hear that so many people get lost. Uh, in the forest, uh, but luckily you can find them and with an app that's easier. Uh, I was surprised that uh, people get lost and then they die because nobody finds them. I thought there was another risk associ associated with mushrooms, uh, at least for me it is because I don't know anything about mushrooms, which is I eat and then, you know, some mushrooms are only edible ones. How do you deal with this type of risk? also right so, this uh, so uh, there is a tra training uh, activity during all the year round so if you want to follow it it's something like 12 hours mm. <laughs> that they train you how to recognize the mushroom because uh, poisoning is still a problem but it's a re really a minor problem is more um, problematic the way they cook the mushroom. So, for instance, much of the, um, let's say, activity that they do in the hospital is just to remove a high quantity of mushroom from uh, uh, Milan people's stomach. So they, they tend to eat uh, too much mushroom uh, so far. So uh, the, the problem is not 
um, to recognize but how much you eat um, how many mushrooms you eat so another huge problem that is facing are wolves because uh, usually uh, pickers uh, tend to to have the the dog with them uh, just for for having company in the forest and very often uh, this dog followed the wolves and uh, it has been eaten. So you lost the dog. It's quite frequent. I mean, there are five, eight Ks per year. So it means uh, quite frequent. So that, that's uh, so far the new emerging problem because the, the wolves uh, uh, that are in the Apennines is like uh, the old wolves uh, they have in Scandinavia. So quite large number. And, and you also mentioned that you know there's a lot of uh, market or a, a rapid development of uh, the mushroom picking during the COVID season. Oh yeah, uh, during the COVID season, um, it was allowed to go in the forest without mask uh, or to have a walk uh, or to have any kind of activity. And thanks to that, uh, for instance, uh, last year <coughs> there were. A lot of people that use the picking permits as excuse to enter in an area where they can uh, relax in the forest. So in that terms, uh, even last year, that forest were uh, very highly fre uh, frequented by uh, recreational pickers. And uh, it was, uh, again, a success that um, show the potential uh, of, uh, for the forest owner when they organize a service like uh, uh, the one that we organize. But do you expect, let's say, let's hope that the COVID ends soon. Do you expect that the trend will continue so that people would still go to forests to uh, eat mushrooms? Uh, I used to, to say it's not a matter of COVID, it's a matter of rain. If it's going to rain, uh, that forest will be full. And there is another issue that is very important. In November, where basically the recreation or touristic activity is practically zero in the valley, mushroom pickers flow inside the, that valley and keep on going a uh, high level of touristic uh, revenue. So it means they rent the room, uh, they stay there for a couple of days. Uh, they ask a service like uh, restaurants, bar, or whatever. And so they keep a very high level of uh, revenue also for the other activity of the valley. So mm -hmm. that are more related to tourism. Okay. Thank you very much. It seems that we, that we have now come to the end of, uh, of our uh, group work. Uh, I would like to thank very warmly to Andreas and Enrico for your presentations, for your input to our interesting discussion, and for, uh, uh, to Alba for putting it down, and to all of you for being with us and having contributed. We will now um, go for a break. Uh, please mute yourself, and then we are looking forward to seeing you back at 11 o'clock. Have a nice break. <laughs>